I heard a pastor speaking this week, and uh, he was talking about how the church probably prayed for James when he was captured and he was, he was killed. And then they prayed for Peter and he was set free. And a lot of the ways, often we approach that scripture and saying, oh, look at uh, God answered their prayer and, and Peter got to, got to come home from jail and he was free. Uh, poor James, he had to die and go be with Jesus. See what's wrong with that picture? God's calling, to a, calling for us to live differently. It's nice to look out and know we have some praise requests this week, some things people have shared with me, some good news. I like that. Brothers and sisters, the way the other kids at school act is not the way God wants you to act. If you're fitting in too well in the workplace, you're doing it wrong. If you're getting your cues on how to live and how to respond and what to value and what priorities we should have from the television, well, that means we're not paying attention to what's right here. The way Jesus Christ, the call he puts on our lives is for us to be countercultural. It's even beyond that. We've said that many of the things Christ calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount are counterintuitive. They're not even natural to our flesh. The natural inclination of our flesh, our fallenness, is to go in a different direction than the direction that God is calling us to. In other words, that knee-jerk reaction is almost always going to be wrong. That tug, that downward tug, the gravity of sin, is going to be pulling us away from God. Brothers and sisters, whether you've been a, a Christian just a very short time or whether it's been decades, our fallenness is still at war with the person that God wants us to be. And here's what that means. I can be ornery. I can pout. I can be nasty. I can be self-righteous. I can be highly critical. I can be filled up with greed and with lust and all of these other nasty, dark things. When I say, you know what? I think I know how to run my life. And the result is not love. When we go down those dark paths... We're going. Can we open up side windows, please? When we go down those dark paths, we're going away from love. Today's message, then, is about the most important topic of all. The reason the universe was born. Did you catch that? The reason we have all of this snow, and underneath the snow, grass, and underneath that, dirt. The reason that there's clouds in the sky, and above that, stars in our universe. The reason that you and I have lungs, and there's air to breathe, the reason the universe is here, the reason that God made the human race, the reason we have babies, the reason that all of us are alive today, that reason is love. The motivator behind creation was love. God eternally existing in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that love relationship. And at the moment of creation, God says, let's create humanity and our image and welcome into this loving relationship. See, God didn't need to create in order to love because he was already in an eternal love relationship, but he created us out of the abundance of his love so that we could come into this. The reason you are here, the reason the universe is here is love. And, and we dare not lose track of that because we do so easily all the time. So many things distract us, so many worries pains and aches and fears and concerns. And they rob us of our purpose. Our purpose, our reason, the point of everything is love. 
Love. Well, why do I wash the dishes? Ultimately, love. Why do I wake up every day when I don't want to and go to work? Ultimately, love. Why am I here this morning? Love. Why don't I just let both barrels rip on that noisy neighbor? Why do I keep smiling at him when I don't always feel like it? Oh, oh, I get it. Why do I bite my tongue sometimes? Because what I'm about to say is not loving. God made you to love. God made us relational beings to relate to one another. Not to be in isolation. He made you to love and to be loved. And he made you to learn to love others the way God loves us. And think about the way God loves us. The Bible says he loved us while we were yet enemies. That Christ was willing to go to the cross for those who say, I'm too busy for him today. That's not supposed to be easy, what I just said. It's supposed to be different. Do you know, the Sermon on the Mount, I've heard, uh, I've heard Jewish people say, I've heard Muslims say, I've heard atheists say. Unfortunately, I've even heard Christians say, uh, the Sermon on the Mount is unrealistic. The things Christ is calling to us are not natural, therefore, it can't be true. I would say that God, the message of God is calling us to something that's very unnatural. Love your enemies. Love those who mistreat you. This is a message only God could give us. That's not natural to my flesh. No human culture does that seem to make sense to. God is calling us to something above and beyond, something way more beautiful than any moral ethic we have within ourselves. This is part four today of how does Jesus want me to live. And we, remember we said, imagine that you're in that first century church when, when the book of Matthew for the first time has come to your church, church and, and it's probably in the home of a wealthy member. There wasn't a big church building at that time. Probably the men were on one side, the women were on another side. And, and, and somebody gets up to read the gospel of Matthew for the first time. And you come to the part about the Sermon on the Mount. And you're, you're hearing these ideas, probably many of them, for the very first time. And what you hear blows you away because of how radical it is. It's not supposed to be a comfortable message. Nobody was sitting there hearing Christ's, Christ's message. He said, if you hate a brother... God calls, holds you guilty of murder. If you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Nobody was sitting there in that room saying, huh, look it. I measure up pretty good. That's not the point. God is calling to us something beyond ourselves. And that's why it's so good and so beautiful and so powerful. This is radical Love. I found a definition of radical online, and I thought that it would be helpful. Thoroughgoing or extreme. Well, I don't want to be an extremist. God calls you to be extreme about love. But I believe there should be balance in all things. Not love. Love God with every fiber of your being, everything you are, all of your heart, all, all of your mind, all of your body. And then love other people. Go for it. Be extreme. Be an extreme lover of people. Be an extreme forgiver. Be extreme with patience. Be extreme with mercy. These things are not natural to me. They're natural to God. That's his nature. And he's transforming our fallen natures to be more like him. What does the Bible have to say about love? Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 right now. The writer says, I will show you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verse 
If I speak in human or angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. It doesn't matter how beautiful my words are. If I don't have love, I'm just making noise. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may, bo uh, that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away the things of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I will know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these th three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And what Paul is saying here, now we know in part, we're like seeing in a mirror, when we see Christ face to face, when we're in the presence of God, we will be filled up with love that will blow away everything else. And there's no going to, there's, no gonna, there's not, never or ever going to be again standing in from, front of God and feeling self-conscious, ashamed, can't have to keep God back because... I'm so bitter and angry with somebody and I know he's not, there's not going to be any of that anymore. It's just going to be love. Love for God and love for one another. Love, the reason the universe is here. Now let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. Kind of threw, threw you for a spin, right? Went to 1 Corinthians. Now we're going back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 43 uh, into the first part of chapter 6 there. And I want you to keep in mind that in the original text, there would not have been a chapter designation, a verse designation. It would have just flowed smoothly. So let's look there from the end of uh, chapter 5. This is Christ talking. He's on a hill, perhaps near the Sea of Galilee. He's on a hill, and uh, thousands of people are listening to him as he speaks. You have heard it said, remember he was going back to the Old Testament, he said, you heard it said, but I say to you, he's speaking differently than a pastor or a rabbi, he was saying he has the right, the ability to further expound, to further expand what scripture is talking about. In the Old Testament, you know it never says, love your enemies. Now, we see God loving his enemies in the Old Testament, but it never says that. We start off with this idea, love your neighbor. Love your brothers. And then God takes that and he reveals it even further. Remember the, the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, everybody's your neighbor. So God takes this seed planted in the Old Testament and he grows it now. Jesus Christ is speaking, uh, expanding what it speaks about in the Old Testament. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Incidentally, people were saying that. Love your, love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. What? The greatest enemy you have this morning to understanding this text is that you've heard it before. Put yourself back in the first century or put yourself on that Galilean hillside. And here's this famous young teacher. And what does he say? Love your enemy. You know, the person who hasn't been treating you well? Love them. The only reason that doesn't feel radical to you today 
is because you're too bored with it. Christ wants to break up and bust apart our lives. Change out everything from the inside out. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. In other words, that you can be just like God. Here's the way God acts. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get for that? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And here's an example where I think Jesus was actually taking it easy on them to make a point. Because the very fact is, we can talk all day to why can't we have peace in the world and why can't people learn to love the people of different races or whatnot. And yet, in our own households, the people we say we love most, sometimes we're just shaking with anger. We have a hard time even loving those we say we love most. That's how messed up we are. And we better come clean with that before the living God if we want him to work in our lives. This is the kind of person I am. I can be very hard on the people I say I love most. Verse 47. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? And right away with my pastor's thought, I thought, during the meet and greet on Sunday morning, I hope everybody's going out of their way to meet other people not just the same people every week. Be perfect, therefore, and we spoke about this last week, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So then when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but... When you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know. And remember, this is in the context here from love. It's moving on. It's a progression. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time with this portion today in chapter 6 other than to say two things. Number one, is it possible that this thought of loving those who are struggling financially but not blowing a trumpet about it is connected to the idea of loving God that we just read? Is it possible that this, this, this passage here, which we, we always read the Sermon on the Mount in chunks. That's why I said go home and read the whole, the whole three chapters. Go home and read the whole thing at one time so you see how it flows. Is it possible that this part right here in chapter 6 was part of the thought that was immediately preceding it. And number two, the command not to blow a trumpet and announce our good deeds is given to the people who are actually out there doing something to help people and putting others, uh, uh, you know, sacrificing themselves to help others. It's not given. It's not given so that other people can sit back and criticize when somebody happens to mention some good deed that they've done. Did everybody follow me on that one? It's so easy to sit back and say, oh, look at that person. They're acting righteous so other people can see it. Oh, come off it. This command is given to people who are doing good and saying, you know, don't do it just to get a pat on the back because that might feel unloving to the people you're helping. And if you're really loving about them, you're not doing it so you can get a pat on the back. But listen, those who are just sitting back in the pew, those who are doing nothing and just looking and criticizing those people who are actually out there doing something to help people, I'll tell you what. If somebody just mentions that uh, they were out helping the poor, you know, there's a lot of reasons they might do it. It might just be casual. Hey, this is what I'm doing in my life. It might be that they're mentioning it because they want to encourage everybody in the church to get out there and do something. But if somebody mentions that they're out there helping the poor, and my reaction is, <laughs> they're just doing that to show off, at least one person in this equation has a heart problem. And that would be me. Brothers and sisters, let other people stand before God themselves. That is judgmental eyes. 
Let's turn them here first. If my natural inclination is to be critical and judgmental of other people, I already know I have a heart problem. Whether they have a, whether they have a heart problem or not is before the living God. That's between them and God. But I better watch my heart. This command is not supposed to be so we can all sit around and look, oh, look at that show off. Look at the way she likes to sing up front. Ha, huh. she does that just to show off. Oh, <laughs> smells like hell to me. Let the pers people who serve deal with their heart before, the, before God. Better yet, let's all serve. <laughs> Every member a minister, remember? A priesthood of believers, a holy nation. So I, I don't want to spend too much time with that. I just want us to be very careful that we don't have this knee-jerk reaction to be critical and judgmental of others. Christ is telling us, don't practice our righteousness in front of other people. Let's deal with that in our own heart. But let's not be quick to... You know, uh, C.S. Lewis rightly pointed out that the people that are most upset about the pride they see in other people are usually very proud themselves. I can't stand how proud that person is. That's usually because their pride is colliding with your pride. <laughs> keep it in mind. It's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, there was a woman who went for counseling to a pastor, and she said to her pastor, uh, Rev, I don't love my husband anymore. He said, well, you know, women are taught in Titus 2.4 to love their husbands. Okay, I know the Bible wants me to love my husband, but he doesn't even feel like my husband anymore. We hardly talk. We're, like, we're, we're alone in the same house. We're strangers. The pastor said, well, Jesus taught us to love strangers. Remember in the parable of the of the Good Samaritan. She, she got exasperated. She said, he's actually more like my enemy. I can't stand him anymore. And the pastor just laughed. He said, you're still not off the hook. See, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us to love our enemies. Love is the greatest dream. It's the highest ideal. It's the most noble motive found in the human heart. It's the closest we can actually get to feeling how God feels when we're being good at loving and forgiving and we're learning what it means to be patient. Love is the best that there is. And love is elusive. Love is frail. Love is broken in this life. It never seems to live up to all that it should be. I thought this church was supposed to be a place where we love and how come I got ignored this Sunday? Or I, sp I thought this small group leader was supposed to love me and yet... They cut me off when I was speaking today. Love is never all it should be. We feel like lo love is never all it should be. You know why? Because we aren't. Because we're frail. Because we're broken. Because I'm not all that I should be. And that's why I fail to love you the way you deserve to be loved. Brothers and sisters, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, my brother... You are a son of the living God, and you deserve a lot more respect and love for me than I'm able to muster in my meager soul. Sisters, you are princesses of the king. You are a daughter of the king. You are beautiful, and God loves you so much he would sacrifice everything for you, and I know this because he already did. And you are not loved and respected as much as you should be in your church. That's the way it is but let's be shooting at the right target. Let's be doing everything we can to be quick to forgive and slow to anger and, and doing away with all these grudges and bitterness. What, what place does bitterness have in our families? What place do grudges have in the church? The answer is none. <coughs> yes, we're frail. Yes, we're broken. Yes, we, we not only fa fail God's standards, we fail to measure up to our own standards, don't we? And that means that when we do learn how to forgive, when we, when we do learn how to actually love people and, and don't let their words hit us so hard and, and we're able to set aside these things and we're able to care about people even when they've let us down before and we're not writing people off because they haven't measured up to our standards, when we're actually learning to love that makes it all the more special, and it glorifies God. When broken people learn how to stick together and love one another, it brings glory to God. 
And there's nothing more beautiful, nothing more powerful in this world than that kind of love. When we learn to love like that, that means God, God is working in our hearts, working in our families, working in our church. In this passage we just read, Christ is responding to people, like I said earlier, who actually believed that when God taught people to love their neighbors in Leviticus 19.18, that the implication was that it's okay to hate your enemies. And right now you're thinking, ooh, that's crazy. And yet, and yet. One medieval scholar taught, if you see a Gentile fall into the sea, by no means lift him out. For it is written, thou shalt not rise up against the blood of thy neighbor. But he is not your neighbor. Did you hear that? A scholar saying, it's written, don't rise up and take the blood of your neighbor. But the Gentile, this fellow, is not your neighbor. Another famous scholar named, uh, I, I have a hard time pronouncing his name, Maimonides, who was born in Egypt around the year 1200, taught that if you are the disciple of a famous teacher and someone insults your teacher, you are to hate that person like having a viper burning in your chest. That's the kind of hate you're supposed to have. And if you don't hate them, you're not showing love to your teacher. You can only decide to forgive that person once they grovel and apologize. Now, I understand faithfulness to your teacher, and you're not going out and having drinks with that guy who's just insulted your teacher and talking bad about your teacher behind his back. I understand all that, but that's very different than saying you should burn with hate in your heart. That's like a viper ready to strike. A Muslim friend of mine once said, that people in his religion are very reasonable and easy to get along with, but if you mess with them, they would open up a can of you-know-what. And notice I got everybody's attention right away at that point. I got to say that more often. <laughs> exactly. Now, I'll tell you what. The self-righteous thing for, for you and I to do at this point would be think, oh, those crazy Muslims. They, wanna, they said, if you're nice to me, we'll be nice, but we're going to open up a can. Oh, those crazy Muslims, <laughs> how different they are. Or how about those Jewish scholars I just mentioned? Oh, those bad scholars. Ooh, scholars. But this isn't a Muslim problem, is it, people? Is it? And this is not a, just a problem of medieval scholars. This is a human nature problem. Is it wrong for Muslims to say, we're reasonable, but if you mess with us, you will regret it? But it's okay for me to say, I'm a nice guy. As long as people don't mess with me, I get along with people. If people would just treat me fairly, but if they don't, watch out. Oh, they messed with the wrong person. Or America is a good country, but if you mess with us, we will escort you to the gates of hell. Does that sound similar? You can hear this mentality on any school ground. Don't mess with me. Don't start with me. What's her problem? What are you looking at? He's looking for trouble. This is actually seeing unkindness as a virtue. This is who I am. I brag about it. I'm a reasonable person. Don't mess with me. I get along with people. Huh. But if you mess with my stuff, you'll regret it. See how natural that comes to us? That is natural. That's the nature of the flesh. And it's wrong. It's hellish. Jesus Christ is calling us to be different than our fleshly urges tell us to be. God is calling us to something way more beautiful than that just naturally flows out of hu the human thought process. And again, I've had atheists and, and people in other religions tell me, and even Christians, they read these passages in the Sermon on the Mount and say, well, that's unrealistic. That's not natural. So it must not be true. Isn't there a different way of thinking about it? Maybe there's a real God and he's calling us to something really different than our own messed up selves. This is not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be divine. This is Holy Spirit. This is supernatural. God's calling us to something wonderful. We 
humans often brag about what's messed up with us. Ha <laughs> ha, you should have seen the way I was drinking. Oh yeah, I, I suppose I have a cussing problem. Nobody messes with me, as if that's a virtue. Not before God it isn't. Not before the Lord. Bragging about our own goodness. Uh, I'm reasonable. I'm a, I'm a good guy. I get along with everybody. And then patting ourselves on the back for being able to make other people suffer when they wrong us. And this mentality can and does affect entire people groups. So that one of the required, you ever notice that when there's a clique or a club or a group or a nation or a religion sometimes, the requirement for joining to be accepted as reasonable, you can be our friend, but you've got to hate those people. And you get together and they start complaining about, and if you want to fit in, you've got to start complaining. You've got to start gossiping. The price for membership is you've got to turn your back on the living God. The KKK is a good example, but they're extreme. We don't have them around here. How about, just think about in school, and you've got one group of, of girls, and, and you want to hang out with them, and, and if you're going to hang out with them, you've got to talk bad about that other group of girls or that other girl. Or how about men who sit around at the workplace or at each other's homes or, or, or at a bar or after church, and they complain about other races? or other nationalities. So those people are just crazy. I don't know what's wrong with them. I, I would get along with them. I'm good. I, I, I've got friends like them. but And if you want to be their friend, the price that you have to pay is also hating that other group of people. Because hatred is seen like a virtue. Plato praised the Athenians because they hated the Persians more than anyone. Here's this awesome philosopher saying, hey, these guys have got their act together because they hate those stinking Persians. And you think God was, oh, I'm so proud of you, Plato. By the way, I'm going to come down and die for the Persians and for, for your people, by the way. God says, I love everybody so much, I'm going to die for their sins. And meanwhile, we, we get around, pat ourselves on the back for the way we can look down at other people. Now, I don't want to obfuscate the issue here, but Christ's point here. By saying that God does, uh, a lot of people get confused at this point. God does, by the way, grant governments and nations the right to defend them, their people. Policemen in a firefight that kill a criminal in the process, that's not the same as you or I getting wronged, and so we go out and we lynch somebody. It's not the same. God has given the state the sword in order to protect its citizens. This topic always seems to come up. Every time somebody reads the Sermon on the Mount, they always say the same thing. Well, that's not practical. What, should all the should judicial system just shut down? Should the judges let everybody go free? How about the military? We don't need police anymore because we're just going to love bank robbers. Are we supposed to put our guns down and just turn the other cheek? The government's supposed to, oh, come on. Let's just set that on the side for right now because, brother, sister, if you hold on to that, you're going to miss what Christ is saying. You're going to miss the point. Here's the question. The question Christ is addressing is, in your daily life, in my life, how do I treat people that have not been fair with me? How do I treat people that have mistreated me? And if you get hung up on all that other stuff, you're missing the point. Why do the Holy Spirit dodge? The Holy Spirit's coming for us. Why, we, why would we move out of the way and throw dust up in the air? We don't need this other issue. We need to deal with our hearts, our brokenness, our nastiness. How do I treat somebody that's been unfair with me? How do I treat somebody that's been gossiping about me? Oh, that hurts. That really hurts. Especially if you trusted that person. Consider them a friend, right? Doesn't that hurt? How do I respond when somebody has disrespected me? Don't diss me, man. When I've been ill-used, I've been taken advantage of. I'm hurt, lied to, ignored. Do I burn with hate like a viper in my chest? Do I nurse a grudge? Do I plot to get back at that person? Or maybe if you're more like me, I just want to shut down and get cold and think to myself, fine, I don't need this person. I don't need this aggravation. I don't need them. If, they don't, if, they, if that's the way they're going to treat people, the heck with them. Why should I put myself out if that's the way they do it? I don't need this. 
and I don't need that person. And Christ is looking down from heaven saying, oh, I died for them. I, oh, wait a second. Dan, where are you going? <laughs> One commentator described what Christ is teaching about love in this way. He said, don't harbor a spirit of resentment. If someone does you an injury or puts you to an inconvenience, show yourself master of the situation by doing something to that person's advantage. That was in a section called Hard Sayings of the Bible. Today we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day uh, when we recall that a, a young Roman teenager living in England was kidnapped by a band of marauders and forced into slavery. Now, we've got gripes, right? <laughs> Kitchen light doesn't work. Front door is not working well. Car having trouble. I was never kidnapped as a teenager and forced into slavery. And this young man, St. Patrick, Maywin Suckett, said he was forced to be a herder of sheep. Most days he had nobody to speak to. He was out there in the cold and the heat, just tending the sheep for six years. And he said, I prayed every day. And finally, he made his escape from his captors. And he went overland 200 miles on foot till he got a boat that could take him back to, to Britain, only to return to the very people that had held him captive many years later as a missionary because God had put love in his heart for the people who had mistreated him, desiring to do good to those who had done harm to him. This is a God thing. When we desire to do good to those who don't deserve it, it's a God thing. Jesus said if we treat other people well to treat us well, what's in it? What, what, what kind of reward are you going to get for that? Nothing. Even a pagan can do that. Jesus says, my way is for my people who follow me to love people who treat them horribly. So here's today's challenge. Sisters, brothers, I want you to think. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you think. Is there a race or a group of people that you have a hard time with? Those people over in the Middle East, they're just always, I can't understand France, or, you know. Or religion, you just can't stand them. Blacks, Mexicans, Jews, Muslims, Norwegians, Canadians, people from Chicago. <laughs> your challenge today is to pray for them with love in your heart. Ask God to help you be humble, not coming condescending. I'm going to Asia but to be humble, to try and understand people whose culture and ways of thinking is different from your own, and ask God for enough love to actually want to become their friends and to share the love of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the cross, so that heaven can be populated by people that you previously had a hard time with. Wouldn't that be beautiful? If God just grabbed a hold of our heart and helped us to fall in love. You know, that's from, Ju from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, the utmost parts of the earth, these Samaritans, totally at odds with the Jews. They hated each other. And Jesus said, I want you to take the gospel there. Find the group of people that we have a hard time with and say, God, give me a heart to love these people and take the gospel there. The next challenge is to think of someone, a particular person, close to home, not some guy in the news who can't stand Tom Cruise. You know, not some guy in the news. Sorry, Tom Cruise just came into my mind. Not some guy on television, but somebody around you that you're with on a regular basis. And you have been, let's be honest, you've had some, you've been harboring unkind thoughts. And sometimes they just make you go, ooh, inside. Or you've been very dismissive of them. Oh, yeah, whatever. Totally writing them off, not listening. It could be someone at work could be somebody at your school, could be somebody here in this room, or it could even be a family member. And here's your challenge. I want you to pray for them 
Pray to love them more than you ever have before. God, break this in me. I see it's from the devil. Lord, I see that your ways are higher than my ways. Break this in me. I want to love these people. Struggle in prayer for more love. We need to be a people of love. Christ said the world's going to know us by our love. I fall short and so do you. Let's struggle for this love. Let's be passionate for this kind of love. Ask God to help you win their heart. God, give me this person's heart. They can't stand me. God, help me win this person. Help me to, and then so we can both get along better. Ask God to help you remember that you can't control how other people talk. You can't control how they look at you or look down at you. You can't control how they treat you, but you can control how you respond to them. That's your heart. And pray and ask the Lord to grant you the same kind of patience that he has for you, the same kindness that he demonstrated on the cross, the same grace that opened heaven's doors for you that you would have that kind of love for that person that the Lord has shown for you. This is not easy. It goes against our nature. And some people might not understand it when you start to act like that. What are you being nice to that person for? Have you seen the way he treats you or she treats you? Some people aren't going to understand. It's radical. Our culture would be shocked by it. It's counter-cultural. It's revolutionary. But God's ways are beautiful. God's ways are the best. And when the Holy Spirit takes control and we learn to live and to think and to speak God's way, the supernatural becomes more and more natural in our lives. And the most real thing in our lives becomes uh, an unreal love for God and others. And that, what could be better than that? What would be more amazing? Brothers and sisters, right now, I want us to all just join our hearts together. And we're going to bow our heads and we're going to talk with God we're going to ask him to do something in our hearts because we need prayer and we need the spirit of the living God to break our hearts. Let's pray right now. Please join with me. Lord God, sometimes we can be so cold. Sometimes we can burn with so much anger. Father, sometimes we're just set in our ways and we don't even, we, we become numb to your spirit. We don't even realize how hard we've been on people. Father, we're asking you this morning to reach inside and break everything that needs to be broken. And we trust you as a master craftsman to put it back together the way you want it to be put together. God, take us. Lord, help us love people through us. Help us to have more love for those that are different, that think differently. For those people who hate us or look down at us and think we're stupid or childish or immature, help us to respond with love. And Father, I pray that in your church, churches across the land, Lord, that there would be a deep love for one another in different denominations, in different churches, in different locations, in different countries, Father, different ways of worshiping, Lord. But all of us who have put our faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, all of us who are committed our lives to following you and and being disciples of, of your word, Lord, I pray that all of us will truly be very patient and very loving with one another. It's easy to be critical, Lord. We can do that without the Holy Spirit. But help us to love. I pray that we're good forgivers, that we're filled up with grace, and that every day, Lord, God, please, I want to be more like you. Help us all to be more like you. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.